Hello everyone, my name is Adam, and welcome into this week's trip down the homeward path. Before we get into things, I've got a few questions. Are you a fan of Magic the Gathering? Presumably so, since you're here listening to a podcast about it, but, you know, what do I know? But is there something else in your life that takes precedence? keeps you away from your magical aspirations, a job, a career, partner, spouse, children, any and all of the above. Listen, I'm right there with you. I have a wonderful wife, three children, full-time job, and a lot of extracurricular commitments that make it really difficult to devote the amount of time, finance, and energy that high-level competitive magic normally takes. But in spite of that, are you, like me, relentlessly seeking improvement every time you get a chance to play? If that sounds like something you're interested in, then I suggest you hop in and buckle up. Now let's go for a ride. But it's a good time to remind you that we are brought to you by the following sponsors. PureMTGO.com is one of the largest depositories of magic content on the web. They've got a little bit of something for absolutely everyone. And I do mean everyone. So head over there, check out their collection of stuff. While you're at it, I understand that the arena grind can feel like a bit of a slog, especially if, like me, you're traditionally at least a free-to-play player. But thanks to our sponsor at Grey Viking Games, you don't have to wander the wilderness in search of your glory on your own. You can head over there and find access to pre-release codes, single pack codes, cosmetics, promo packs, uh, card sleeves, any and all of the above. So go and find your glory at grayvikinggames.com and if you want to support this show in a much more direct fashion don't forget to head over to patreon.com slash homewardpathmtg this show is always going to be free but if you like what we're doing enough to help us keep doing it go over, become a patron and take advantage of your rewards and if you've got questions, comments or concerns about the show or you just want to talk you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Homeward Path MTG. You can find me on Facebook. My name is Adam Spain, like the country. Yes, I got picked on about that for most of my life. And you can join the conversation in the Facebook group, the Homeward Pathfinders. So head over, check all that stuff out while you continue to listen on the homeward path. Different car, hopefully same great content. How's it going everybody? Hope it's been a good week off for you. Uh, For those of you who didn't catch the announcement last week or fast forwarded through it because you know it usually takes me a minute to get started. Remember, July 31st, uh, 11 a.m., the Scottish Inn in Jackson, Tennessee, we are having a modern benefit tournament to help cover the medical bills for my daughter that her insurance refused to cover. Again, masks will be required. And if you're not interested in playing the main event, based on reception so far, I'm not expecting a massive amount of people to show up. So if you wanna show up and play some commander, be my guest. I'm gonna be right there with you. So remember July 31st, 11 a.m. Scottish Inn, Jackson, Tennessee. Hopefully I can see you there. So, let's go in to Budget Spotlight. Budget Spotlight is a segment where we talk about an uncommon, a rare, a mythic, and a commander-oriented card that I think are worthy of well more than the price they currently command on the market. And first up is our uncommon Abundant Harvest. Abundant Harvest is a single green mana for a sorcery. It debuted in Modern Horizons 2 most recent reprint was in the Strixhaven Mystical Archive. I guess technically it was the other way around, right? We got it in the Strixhaven Mystical Archive first, and then we got it in Modern Horizons too. But whatever. 
<clears throat> Abundant Harvest is one green mana, sorcery. Choose land or non-land, then reveal cards from the top of your library until you hit a card of the chosen type, put that card into your hand, put the rest on the bottom in a random order. <clears throat> so, objectively one of the most interesting cantrip designs I've seen in recent memory. We've had a ton of different variations on the one mana draw card sorcery, or instant as the case may be, in all the colors, right? Like red, red usually gives you haste. Uh, black usually draws an extra card at the cost of something or what have you, you know, village rights being kind of the current example of the black one mana cantrip and it's very good, but you know, blue has a lot of things to choose from in this department. Green kind of historically has been look at so many cards from the top of your library and get one of two card types, usually a creature or a land or sometimes a permanent, sometimes a specific creature type, but nothing quite like this. This is just a lot more interesting than the rest of those, right? You just, you're either going to completely mitigate your mana flood or you're going to completely, uh, or you're going to find the land you need to continue casting your spells. Like, it is exactly what you need. If you need gas, it can go get you non-lands. If you need mana sources, it can get you land drops. And for my money, and for the record, the price is 35 cents. You can do a lot worse than this. And I'm not talking just about modern or legacy. I'm talking about commander. Like, this is really good in Commander. Especially when you can when you combine it with anything that allows you to copy or reuse it. Think, you know, something as innocuous as a Seagate Stormcaller, all the way up to something as busted as, like, a Vadrock that can repeatedly recast it. You know, you keep naming non-land to find you mutate creatures, and then you cast it again. That's pretty good, right? So, it goes from already really good to like up into the stratosphere when you start trying to break it a little bit. And again, the the irony in the name is not lost on me because it is literally one trigger of the enchantment abundance. So you're performing an abundant harvest. Well played, Watsy. 35 cents, come on, we can do a lot worse for 35 cents and one mana. Moving on to our rare, and this is one I don't know if I've talked about before, but probably not because it is on the higher end of what I would call the budget spectrum. When I list cards in this segment, I usually try to keep them under $10. And ideally under 5 So this one is kind of in that between space between the 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 middling and the top end of what I would consider to be a budget-friendly card. But, that card is Thought Not Seer. Um, mana cost, three and a colorless. It has, for those of you who don't know, who didn't play during Oath of the Gatewatch Standard, haven't been exposed to it through other formats, the colorless mana symbol in the mana cost means it has to come from a land that produced specifically colorless mana. Uh, waste is the basic land that does it, notably doesn't have a type, but waste is the basic land that does it, and then, you know, something as innocuous as a pain land or the deserts from uh, Amonkhet are good examples of lands that give you colorless. Field of Ruin, Faceless Haven, these are all lands that make colorless mana for the purpose of playing this card. And what it gets you, three into colorless, gets you a 4-4 four, four creature. When this creature enters the battlefield, look at your opponent's hand and exile a card from their hand. A non-land card. Just get it. It's gone. Not, not, not while Thought Not Seer is on the battlefield. Not while, uh, not until, or, you know, there's no trigger that gives it back to them when you 
get rid of it. No. The, the downside trigger for when it dies is they draw a card. They draw a card. That's the downside to Thought Not Seer, is your opponent draws a card. Okay, so, four mana, four, four, take the best card out of their hand, and they don't get it back. It's the easiest, cleanest answer when someone says, hey, why would you be interested in playing an Eldrazi deck? Uh, you just point at this card. That's why I'm interested. It's an efficient, it's, it's a solid rate body, hand disruption, has synergy with blink effects where you can try to like get as many of your opponent's important cards as possible. Like just top to bottom, it is really good. <laughs> And really good at what it does. And price on that is $7. Again, a little bit above what I would call the low end of our budget spectrum, but very, very, very affordable in the grand scheme of trying to buy into the Eldrazi deck. Like, the rest of the cards in the deck are actually a lot cheaper than I thought they were. So then it's just a matter of figuring out what you want your mana base to look like, because, again, you've got to balance sources that's going to be another episode one of these days uh shall we say devoid of reasoning moving on our mythic this week is magma opus this is new ish from strixhaven i know i haven't done this one before because it just came out and i haven't gotten to play with it yet but i've had it used against me plenty of times magma opus is six a blue and a red instant i think Maybe a sorcery. No, it's an instant. It has to be an instant. Uh, four damage divided as you choose among any number of targets. Tap two uh, permanents your opponent controls. Make a 4-4 elemental creature token. And draw two cards. That's your eight mana package. That's what you get for eight mana when you play Magma Opus. You... Deal damage, tap two things, make a 4-4, four, four, and draw two. It's likely easier to ask what this card doesn't do. Because you get a litany of tempo-positive things all in one package. Like, give me my things. Uh, we're going to end step, kill all your 1-1 one, one blockers, tap down your big blockers, make a 4-4, four, four, and draw two. Or if we're already way ahead, you know, four damage to you, tap down your two blockers, make a 4-4, four, four, draw two. It represents an eight-point swing that way. It also has another ability, which is for double red-blue hybrid. So either red or blue twice. Discard this card and create a treasure token. The discard enables a bunch of synergy from adding artifacts to the board for things that care about you controlling artifacts or just being an artifact to pick up a pair of scissors. Casting your spells faster, which is something you're much more interested in in standard than you are in other formats, but Magma Opus in the context of the Is It Dragons deck allows you to cast Galazeth Prismari on turn three, which then helps you cast Goldspan Dragon on turn four, which then lets you cast the the new dragon from Strix, or not Strix, but from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, whose name I can't remember, but it's the 6-6 Flying H dragon that's really, really good. And I love it, and it can't be countered, and you just... Like, curving out like that just feels obnoxious, right? You know, 3-4 on turn 3, 4-4 four, four haste attack you for 7 on turn 4, 6-6 six, six haste attack you for 13 on turn 5. That's, that's lethal. That's just casually turn fiving your opponent in standard in a deck full of expensive cards. So casting your spells faster, it's also a good card to have in the graveyard for things like uh, Torrential Gear Hulk in older formats, be it Historic, Pioneer, Commander, or Torrent Sculptor in standard, where I have been on the receiving end of a beatdown from this, where they discard cycle the the Magma Opus, play Torrent Sculptor on turn three because you've got a treasure. Torrent Sculptor exiles 
magma opus and puts four plus one plus one counters on itself. So it's a four mana creature, so it doesn't die to an unkicked Blood Chief's Thirst or an Eliminate. It has Ward, so anything that could re reasonably kill it on turn three can't. <laughs> and it's bigger than anything else your opponent can play at the same point in the mana curve. So it's just really, really good. And then last but not least, the weirdest synergy it's got is the ability to put a token on the field, a treasure on the field, specifically an artifact treasure on the field, for indomitable creativity in Historic and Pioneer. For those of you who don't know what the combo is, Sage of Fables and Locust God allows you to make, to essentially draw your deck, make a bunch of 1-1s with haste and kill your opponent. Uh, if you indomitable creativity for X equals two, you destroy two creatures or uh, artifacts, and the only two creatures in your deck are Locust God and Sage of Fables. Got them. And then last but not least, or sorry, Magma Opus price tag. This is the part that got me. All these things it does, right? $2.50 for a mythic instant with all of those applications. I'm just, you know, magma opus indeed. Moving on, our last card is Maze Mind Tome. Two generic, buys you an artifact. And, sorry, two, man, two generic mana, buys you an artifact that sits on the table. For, you can tap it, put a page counter on it, and scry one, or you can pay two mana tap it, put a page counter on it, and draw a card, and then if you've got four page counters on it, it exiles itself and you gain four life. So until the printing of Esper Sentinel in Modern Horizons 2, this was sadly the best white card draw spell in ADH. Like, I know Land Tax exists, and Arrest Coast Explorer exists, and Mangara exists, but this this was the one. This was the best one. Because it is splashable. You can play it in any color. And it draws up to four cards. If it just sits there on the table and does nothing else, it draws four cards. But in all seriousness, it's a splashable card draw spell. And if you've got any amount of the ability to sacrifice it and recur it before you put the fourth page counter on, whether it be, you know, something as embarrassing as like a Claws of Jix to sacrifice it to gain a life and then get it back with something else later. Or, you know, going into where I'm probably going to play it, which is in Glissa the Traitor, where I can sacrifice it to really anything that eats an artifact. You know, Defiant Salvager comes to mind, can eat it put it in the graveyard and then we kill a creature and pick it back up, recast it, keep drawing cards. It really can help power a myriad of weird archetypes. And also not for nothing, it's got synergy with blink effects. Uh, Brago King Eternal loves this card, right? Because you activate it, draw a card, attack, uh, blink it, it comes back untapped with no page counters, activate it again, draw a card. You just do that every turn. Two mana, you know, four mana a turn draws two cards every single turn. It's a better rate JM Day Tome. So, Maze Mind Tome's price is $3. We can do a lot worse than that, folks. Moving on to segment number two, Brew of the Week. And I am being very, 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 very lax with the use of the term brew here, uh, because this is, we're, we're talking about the best deck in standard today. I'm not gonna mess around with it today. All right. Before we go any further into this, into this topic, please note that from here on out, when I refer to a standard deck as something that is budget, I am specifically talking about arena budget i.e. fewer rare or mythic wild cards than I ever would have expected 
and or cards that I've had from getting into select staples over the last couple of years. So, the deck, the brew of the week this week is Is It Dragons in Standard? And let me be very clear, this is the best deck in Standard in my mind. And when I say that, I don't mean it's the most powerful deck in Standard. That, are, that distinction belongs to Sultai Ultimatum. This deck is the closest thing this current standard format has to Jund. Which is to say, it's a deck that is very, very flexible. And can kind of just take on all comers. You've got great interaction in the form of cards like Frostbite, Dragon's Roar, or Dragon's Fire, sorry. You know, Frostbite, Dragon's Fire. Right now you have Bone Crusher Giant. Uh, less impressive given the prevalence of Mono Green, but yet still very, very, very good. Access to Burning Hands for that matchup after sideboarding. Or, you know, if you're feeling particularly frisky, you can play them in the main deck. If you're just really tired of getting run over by Love Struck Beast, and I don't blame you. Uh... You've got access to counter spells like Saw It Coming, Essence Scatter, Mystical Dispute. I mean, you've got really strong card selection in the form of cards like Expressive Iteration, uh, Maze Mind Tome, aforementioned in this show, uh, Behold the Multiverse, if that's something you're interested in. Like, there's a lot to choose from as to how you want your deck to work. And then you've got Premier Threats. Right now, Bone Crusher Giant is still a very good game-ending threat as a 3-mana 4-3 that punishes your opponent for targeting it. Uh, you've got... Sorry if you hear background noise. My youngest child is in the car with me today. I didn't get to record before going out. So we are recording... I didn't get to record before I came home Thursday. So we are recording Friday afternoon as we're doing errands to catch up through the week. So bear with me if you hear baby talk in the background. He's two and I can't... He, anybody who's got a two-year-old, you know he's not going to be quiet. So, with that in mind, your threats in this deck are ridiculous. <laughs> You've got access to Bone Crusher Giant, Gold Span Dragon as sort of the gold standard, you see what I did there, of how you're going to close out the game. But on top of them, you've also got additional new cards. You've got Emdrith from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms that, rep that represents both a four-turn clock on its own and the ability to draw additional cards to keep your clock rolling. You've got access to Galazeth Prismari, if that's something you're interested in. Additional treasure creation, the ability to tap your Maze Mind Tomes for mana to avoid having to, you know, to be able to leave additional mana up and to be able to uh, avoid having it run out of page counters. You can still let it sit there on the battlefield and get used for something. And it's another dragon for Dragonic Roar for what, it, for what it's worth. It's not, not... Why do I keep saying Dragonic Roar? Dragon's Fire. I played the card all morning. I know what it is. There's also a lot of variation between lists, and that's what really gets me excited about this deck, is because there's not one set list that's correct. Because what your list looks like depends very, very, very heavily on what you want to beat. And that's kind of the first thing to answer when we go away from the core concept and into customization, is what do you want to beat? Because your top end, like how you win the game is pretty clearly defined. You want to play dragons, you want to attack with them, you want them to generate value, and you want to bury your opponent relatively quickly in the mid game. 
you know you want the game to last about five six turns so you can get set up and then you want it to last about three or four more with that in mind there's a lot of different things you got to tackle in the current standard environment there's hyper aggro decks like cycling like uh oh gosh i can't i can't think cycling mono red uh gruel the magecraft decks you know things of that nature that are miserable to play against if you're not playing enough removal if you don't end up playing something like crush the weak or cinderclasm you can get got by those decks pretty easily uh you've got other mid-range decks like the various forms of adventures uh the sedgemore witch tokens decks or the the current like popular rakdos sacrifice deck but between your main deck and sideboard the only permanent type you can't get clean clean easy answers to is enchantments and even then you can get them off the table long enough right like and depending on your opponent's build, you know, if we're talking about something like an Esper Doom Foretold, you might be able to just jam haste creatures into their face and kill them that way. Even though the Doom Foretold is going to keep ticking away, you just jam a gold span, attack, make a treasure, get them for four. If you can't get the Doom Foretold off the field before your turn, get another gold span on the table, play the, the six mana can't be countered six six haste jam it get them for six if you got extra mana to pump into it pump it into it just deal as much damage as you can and make it to where they've got to spend mana and spend resources to recover life total instead of letting them continue to get ahead on cards and win that way like it's it's the kind of deck that can be customized to beat whatever you need to beat and that's really a big part of why i love it so the other question in customization is how do you tackle the mirror from your between your main deck and sideboard plan? Because while Sultai Ultimatum remains the most popular deck, this deck has a pretty strong representation in the metagame too. And I'm I'm here for it. I love it. But you gotta have a plan for the mirror. Are you gonna try to go under them with cards like Sprite Dragon or Ascendant Spirit, which would I, which is something I would call a little bit of a tech card because, you know, Dragon's Roars or Dragon's Fire. I'm going to get that card's name wrong every time, apparently. But Dragon's Fire is not great against the Mirror unless it's killing a Goldspan Dragon. And even then, you're opening yourself up to your opponent's mana production. They get extra treasures. Like... It's, it's not a great place to be. You'd almost rather just counter the dragon. So do you get under it after sideboarding with something like an Ascendant Spirit or a Sprite Dragon that may make them board back into this these kind of mopey spot removal spells in Game 3? Do you go over the top of them by playing additional big, dumb dragons? In particular, because counter spells are so good in the mirror, do you just max out on the 6-6? Six -six? I'm thinking about it. Do you focus on counter magic as the interactive choice, or do you try to find ways to trade one for one uh, consistently? And do you have or need a control matchup plan? Like, Sultai Ultimatum doesn't count. It's a mid-range deck that goes over the top of you. But if we're talking about Demir control, if we're talking about uh, blue-white control with the book, the Bookhaven combo, whatever right? You probably want to have a plan. Even if it's not a good one, it's important to have a plan. Whether that plan is similar to what we're talking about to win the mirror by, you know, making them board out a lot of their spot removal and relying on board wipes, and then you just jam a small creature that grows. So from an overview outlook perspective, despite being among the very best in standard, and I do mean that, this deck isn't really all that obnoxious when it comes to wildcard requirements. You need... The build I'm playing right now, I think you need... Six Mythics, the four gold span, and the two 
or the four gold spin, the one Emdrith, and the one uh, six drop. And then like two tomes, four bone crusher for rares. And then river glide pathway and fable passage. So, you know, from that perspective, it's not expensive. There's a lot of uncommons and commons in this deck for being as good as it is. And that's a big part of why I love it. Is I didn't have to shell out and break the bank for it. But coupled with just how many of its best cards are not rotating from standard, this represents a great wild card investment because, you know, if you don't want to get Bone Crushers, you don't have to. You can replace it with main deck Burning Hands or something else. You know, you don't have to get specifically Bone Crusher Giant. It's better. But you don't have to specifically get Bone Crusher Giant. But, you know, your gold span dragons are going to be around for another year in standard. They may or may not get banned depending on how good they are. They're really, really good. So they're a card you want to have anyway. You know, you definitely want to get your lands, your pathways, and your fable passages because those are things we want to have around after for Eternal Flight anyway. And then, you know, the new big dumb dragons. They're brand new. We got them for another year. So, from the standpoint of getting bang for your buck, I have not found a better deck. It's definitely one that I look forward to playing for a long time and trying to kind of master the nuances of. Take advantage of, uh, of an experience gap in head-to-head -head matchups. And then... You know, from an overview outlook perspective on like whether or not you want to get into this, the deck's greatest strength is its flexibility. Yes, it's got some power to it. Goldspan Dragon is a very powerful magic card. Expressive Iteration is a very powerful magic card. But at its core, your your game plan is flexibility. You want to kind of gradually wear your opponent down and limit the number of things they can get to that will kill you and then have answers to those. So the deck's greatest strength is its adaptability, is its flexibility, and we do well to remember that going forward. So moving on from the other two segments into our main topic of the week, the question was broached on Twitter and it became a sort of a trend that everybody was, was answering was name five decks that defined you as a player. As opposed to the other one that I've answered in the past directly on Twitter as five decks that defined you as a deck builder or uh, the one that I did on here, which was five players who influenced me as a deck builder. This time I wanna do five decks that define me as a player. Now, why did I decide to do this as an episode instead of just responding on Twitter? The short answer is Twitter only gives me so many characters and I didn't want to do a note and then post it because typing is aggravating. And I thought it would be a good, a good exercise to talk about like what these decks did both in a vacuum and in the context of their formats versus what we can learn from them even today. Because I'm a firm believer in the value of learning from history. So, with that in mind, let's dive in to deck number one. Deck number one was my first competitive deck, Heartbeat Harvest. And I talked at length about how good this deck was before but to recap what it did it was an alarmingly consistent ramp combo hybrid where you were interested in hitting a lot of lands in play you wanted to ramp your your land count really high in conjunction with the standard legal mana flare at the time heartbeat of spring which allowed everybody's lands to tap for an additional mana. Well, then with multiple heartbeats, you would get multiple additional mana. 
and things would go sideways for the opponent very, very quickly. In the case of this deck, you were interested in using that mana in conjunction with Early Harvest to sort of function as a high tide turnabout. You wanted, heart, you wanted Heartbeat of Spring to serve as your high tide and Early Harvest to serve as your turnabout. And you wanted to make exorbitant amounts of mana and then you would point either Maga Traitor to Mortals or Invoke the Fire Mind directly at your opponent's face. Strictly speaking, the most consistent variation of the deck would have actually cut the Maga altogether. But given that cards like uh, Muddle the Mixture were really popular in Standard at the time, Maga was sort of a hedge of a card I can go get and win through Muddle the Mixture and make it to where they have to they have to have more specific counter magic in order to beat me. But you wanted to chain multiple early harvests together, get up over 30, you know, get up over 24 mana, and then just MAGA kill you. Invoke kill you. You know, you were you were searching for a lethal play line in conjunction with your absurd amounts of mana production. And I mean, barring that, you had Sakura Tribe Elder, Rampant Growth, Kodama's Reach, alongside Sensei's Divining Top. So, I mean, you had the capacity within that framework. Like, whatever you sideboard into, you're going to be able to find it. <laughs> So you, you know, in your aggressive matchups where you're trying to race to see who gets done first, you're not taking any damage from your lands because they're all basics. They have to be for early harvest to work. You can board into things like Savage Twister that will clear an opponent's board. And then you have access to invoke the Fire Mind and Maga to go over the top of them pretty early in the game. Even if they don't kill them, like, invoke for X equals 5 and you just kill their creature. Or invoke for X equals 3 and you just draw 3 more cards. With the board relatively clear. You know, to say nothing of wicked fast combo draw buries your opponent in the, cert, in the dirt. You know, you Elder on turn 2, Chump Block Sacrifice on turn 3... Plus, Kodama's Reach gets you up to six mana on turn four, and if your hand is perfect, you can just combo off right now. And then of note, you also had access to transmute cards. You were playing Muddle the Mixture yourself. You were also playing Drift of Phantasms, which allowed you to spend mana to discard them and you could go get a card with the same mana value. Well, nine times out of ten, what you would be doing is you'd be either transmuting Drift of Phantasms to go get Invoke, Early Harvest, or MAGA directly, or you would be transmuting Muddle the Mixture to go get Weird Harvest, which would go get you multiple Drift of Phantasms, which would then be able to transmute into Early Harvest, MAGA, or Invoke directly. But having access to the combination of Transmute Cards, Divining Top, and Land Ramp is what made this deck so special to me. Because you just, you could find whatever you needed. Like, I, I can't overstate that. We talk about how busted Sensei's Divining Top is with Fetch Lands in Legacy. Or was in Legacy how busted it still is with fetch lands and commander and we had it in standard in a deck that wanted to play 12 rampant growths or at least 10 you maxed out on elder and reach and then you probably played like two regular rampant growths but i digress what this deck did and the thing we can learn from is this was a standard format that had a lot of counter magic available. Like Mana Leak, Remand, 
were both in standard at the time. Cards like Exclude, Muddle the Mixture, you had Boomerangs. You know, Blue had some tools at its disposal. Nobody cared. Most of the decks that were playing Blue were playing Remand and nothing else. And if you were up against one of those decks, you would just try to muddle their Remand when they went to cast Remand to bounce your lethal spell back to your hand. You wanted to get to 25 mana instead of 23. So that you could leave up double blue for muddle for their remand and win that way. Like, it was not... Uh, it was very little concern to get countered into oblivion by a given deck. Now, of course, this all changed with the release of Cold Snap. But by then, we were already trying to prep for our first standard rotation, so it didn't really much matter anymore. So, what we learned from this is this deck preyed really heavily on a standard format that really wasn't interested in interacting with spells on the stack. They wanted to mess with your hand, and they wanted to keep control of the board, but neither of those things were particularly viable against this deck because so many cards represented the ability to get to other cards and so much of what you did just happened on the stack or killed your opponent when it entered the battlefield. So this was a case of tap out control becoming so prevalent and because tap out was the default mode and they weren't interested in protecting their setups, you don't really care if they have a Maloku. You don't really care if they have a Kega. You just kill them. That's the end of it. So that's a lesson to learn is when the control decks are fighting, are more interested in fighting over the board and are not playing enough counter magic, are not respecting the threat of getting killed out of nowhere, being the deck that kills them out of nowhere is a really good place to be because you're basically gambling against your fail state in your proactive matchups, but then your reactive matchups almost feel like buys. So that was Heartbeat Harvest. Moving on to deck number two, and this is the very next one I played that was competitively viable. Uh, we, we poked around with a few other options, but we didn't have the mana bases to make them work. But this one, this one, this one hit a little different. And that is Draw New Teachings, or specifically just the Teachings deck in general, from Ravnica Time Spiral Standard. So where Heartbeat Harvest taught me how to be proactive in a, a relatively reactive format, Teachings was the opposite. This was my first real control deck. Like, I played around a little bit with Blue Red Tron during that little snippet of time where it was good. And it was still fine. I enjoyed it. I played a lot. But it was not the most viable of decks all the time. With that in mind, Teachings was a, just took a little bit of a different angle on it. You know, the format as a whole was largely built around these aggro decks like Boros, Dragonstorm combo decks, and the mid-range decks of choice were a green-red deck that I am not going to refer to by its name made popular by Mike Flores, and a blue-green deck called Scribbin Force that just wanted to jam a 5-mana 8-8 trample on the battlefield and dominate you that way. So, while you had a plethora of aggressive creature decks, none of them were, like, full of haste creatures and lots and lots and lots of burn spells. Most of them just wanted to play creatures to the board. They had some burn spells to supplement where they could. 
which is a great place to be if you are interested in playing 16 counter spells. When the proactive decks are slow, and I don't mean slow in the sense that they couldn't kill you on turn 5 if you didn't interrupt them. What I mean is slow in the sense that they couldn't kill you on turn 5 through multiple removal spells. The way some of the ones we've dealt with since could. So in the context of the format, it was fine to be a reactive deck full of counter spells. It wasn't scary. On top of that, you got access to some interesting removal spells. You got to play around with some cute options. And you were at it at your very core with this deck. You were interested in two words all the time. Three words. Draw, land, go. Sometimes it was draw, land, attack, go. But for the most part, it was draw, land, go. Because... Everything in your deck you could play on your opponent's turn. But unlike the flash decks of the past couple of years when we had Nightpack Ambusher in standard, this deck was much more interested in a slow, grindy game than it was trying to sneak a, a big dumb threat in under counter magic and kill your opponent quickly. You you were much more interested in just Letting your opponent throw themselves into the wall a few times, let them, let them take some losses in card advantage, and then you pick yours back up with cards like Think Twice and Whispers of the Muse in the late game. But ultimately, the way you won would be something as, as, as embarrassing as Urza's Factory or... Um, Skeletal Vampire in the original list. It eventually grew to become a Vesuvian Shapeshifter Brine Elemental combo that would allow you to keep your opponent's mana tapped while you attack them for 10 a turn. But it was something you would eventually get to, not something you were interested in getting to as quickly as possible. And what this deck taught me more than anything else was discipline. In deck building, in gameplay, both. Because it was really easy to just play too many of the wrong thing. Play too many uh, three mana hard counters. Play too many bad soft counters. Like if you wanted to try to play Rune Snag and Mana Leak and Remand and you know the bounce and the bounce spells and Muddle, something had to give. So you ended up playing around with other numbers. You played more uh, removal. You know, Terror was a really good card at the time. Because it took care of nearly everything. Seize the Soul was another one that we played in unfortunate numbers, but it was because it made a chump blocker, or sometimes that one one would just go the distance. But it was the kind of deck that just, it, it had a very clearly defined path to victory. And if you tried to deviate from that, if you got, if you got happy, you got aggressive, you got excited, you'd get punished for it. So it taught me, above all else, remain disciplined, stick to the plan. So moving from a deck that was absolutely, completely and utterly uh, stuck in its ways about trying to prolong the game as long as possible, we go to the deck that came to define a color combination. So much so that when you say the word Jund, everybody knows what your deck is about. This being the original Jund Cascade deck in standard from Alara Zendikar. And let's be real. This deck was really good. It was really good. It was the first deck to bear the name, simply referred to by and large as Jund. It remains the template for a deck where a color combo explains exactly what you're all about. Jund was a deck that was built around aggressively trading resources one for one with your opponent until your opponent ran out of gas 
while you found ways to get enough two-for-ones to stay ahead. The poster child for the deck was Bloodbraid Elf, which was a walking two-for-one and enabled a lot of your uh, aggressive draws in, pro in reactive matchups where opponents were just kind of staying back a little bit too much. The curve of Putrid Leech into Sprouting Thrinax into Bloodbraid Elf into Blightning was backbreaking for a lot of players, wherein you would be able to threaten to just brain them. You know, turn two Leech, get in for four by paying the two life. Turn three Thrinax, you know, turn uh, with the Thrinax on turn three. Turn four Bloodbraid into Blightning. Dome you for three, rip two cards out of your hand, attack with everybody, so I'm attacking for ten after getting in for four, and dealing three more. In a format with fetch lands in, involved. Suffice it to say it was more than a little bit possible. You'd just get there any burn spell off the top of the deck because again lightning bolt was legal and standard a second copy of lightning could get there or uh you know siege gang commander plus the ability to shoot with tokens whatever right you were much more interested in games that ended in the like turn six to eight range wherein you could just get a broodmate dragon after you've softened him up a little bit and broodmate would dome them for eight twice and that'd be the end of the game but at its core you were a deck that was interested in a fish mana efficient one for one trades and taking advantage of little packets of two for one card advantage does that sound familiar sounds an awful lot like what the is it dragons deck is doing in standard but this deck did it first and this deck did it the best you had an abundance of efficient removal, things like Lightning Bolt, things like uh, Terminate. And then you had versatile removal in the form of Maelstrom Pulse that would be able to take out any non-land permanent. As well as a swath of tokens. And then you had Blightning as a Mind Rot that just also happened to shorten the game. And what this deck taught me more than anything else, it was the first best deck I ever played. I tried so hard for so long to be different, to be unique, to be innovative. This was the first time I just said the heck with it. I had all the cards. Instead of trying to be cute, we'll just play the best deck I can possibly build. And we'll go from there. There's no reason to make it harder than it has to be, especially if you don't have to go out of your way to get into it. And that was a lesson I kept with me for a while. As I put in the notes, I said, there, it showed me it's okay to play the best, de the best deck and ignore the names you're called from doing so. I can't tell you how many times I sat down to play that deck while it was legal played Savage Lands on turn one and my opponent looked at me and we go, oh, John. It's John. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, it is. But it's good. It's so good. Because after all, style points don't appear on your match slip. You don't get any Swiss standing points from having a cool deck. Next on the list is one of the more recent ones, the most recent one that I've played the longest. I'll put it that way. It's the deck I played the longest since I came back to Magic after my break, and that is Mono Blue Tempo. Mono Blue is the most textbook example of the whole being infinitely superior to the sum of its parts. This deck is one that proved to everyone and I do mean everyone that you don't have to shell out a fortune to play a good deck in standard 
playing standard regularly isn't about always just spending the most money. Because let me tell you, it was very satisfying. When you smash in the face of the green, black, or Sultai mid-range players that had shelled out $40 a copy for their Hydroid Crisis, and you're playing a bunch of mopey $1 and $2 common and uncommon. And you give them the business for three games. <laughs> it's fun. Uh, what the deck did is it was a kind of a mopey assortment of 1-1s for one that had evasion. Initially, it was uh, Miscloaked Herald and Slitherblade while Amonkhet was still in standard. Coupled with... Uh, I guess Amonkhet... Yeah, Amonkhet would have been in standard with it on. But initially you were just playing a bunch of unblockable creatures and it never really caught on that you wanted to play those alongside counter spells. At the time you were playing the unblockable creatures alongside a bunch of auras, like the cartouches that gave you value on entry, and then you just wanted to maximize the value of those. But it very quickly became clear that Curious Obsession was one of the best cards, the standout cards in that, in that archetype. And I wanted to know more, so I just kind of leaned heavier into it. And the more I pushed on Curious Obsession, the more I liked where it was going, to the point that I became borderline obsessed with it very curiously. Uh, and then Amonkhet and, and uh, Kaladesh rotated at a standard, and we got a, like a nice reset on the format. And every time a format resets down to small card pools, mana curves go up, cards get more expensive. But we got some counter spells at the same time. Notably, we had gotten Wizard's Retort in Dominaria, and it was just not a card I considered. We already had Siren Storm Tamer. We already had Dive Down. These were, aside from Retort, these were all cards I was already playing in the Blue White Auras deck. But it was really easy at that point to just cut the white. And actually, for a while, I played it with a black splash to play Kite Cell Freebooter, snipe away board wipes, and just be another flying creature to wear Curious Obsession. And it was a deck that I played up until the mono blue version became more popular. I, you know, figured it, I, I found the list, started from a templated list, and then iterated on it several, several, several times until it ultimately just became an unplayable deck when Curious Obsession rotated. The way the deck worked is you just got threats on the board, Curious Obsession made them bigger and allowed you to stay ahead on card advantage, and you just used the cards in your hand to time walk your opponent. That's what you were here for. You were here to make sure your opponent did not get a meaningful turn once you had a board presence. That's not to say your opponent wouldn't do anything. Sometimes they play a big dumb creature and you'd be fine with that because you'd have Merfolk Trickster to tap it down and get in again. Draw another card. Sometimes you'd be attacking. Or sometimes your opponent's attacking. You use Merfolk Trickster as a Doom Blade. Make their creature lose flying. Block it. Kill it. But then Ravnica Allegiance came along and gave us Terramander, and that is when the deck went bananas. Because it finally had a threat that could get massive on its own in the mid to late game. Because you were using these counter spells and these bounce spells and these cantrips like Opt. You, I'd argue you only played Opt because of the synergy with uh, words failing me. I would argue you only played Opt because of the synergy with Terramander. Because while it did help smooth your draws, I don't know how good it really was. Obsession was far and away the best card in the deck. It wasn't particularly close. But what this deck taught me, more than anything else, more than any other deck I've ever played is that I can, on occasion, 
trust what I'm seeing in my own independent testing. I have full, full disclosure here for a long time. I have had a massive inferiority complex when it comes to how I think about magic or, you know, how I, how I do in magic, what I work on in magic compared to people who do it a lot more than me. People who have more time to devote to the game, more time to devote to testing, I tend to defer to other people a whole lot more than I just trust my gut because I am operating under the assumption that I have incomplete information. But this was an example of a deck where I was on the right track. I just needed to keep going. Keep streamlining, you know. And for what it's worth, the blue-black version was still really fun because Thief of Sanity instead of Tempest Gen made for some really interesting mid-range games. But that was the big takeaway from Mono Blue Tempo. And part of the reason I played it for so long is because, like, I was right about something and I wanted to show people just how right I was. But it was it was just an absolute blast to play. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and it's something that I revisited several times, even since it rotated out of standard. I played it in Pioneer tournaments locally. I've used the framework from it to work on current standard decks to absolutely no success at all, but there's no reason not to, you know. Embercleave is a problem, but the rest of the format's okay. And then last but not least, deck number five is the one I've put the most amount of time into recently, and I mean very recently. And that is the Arcanist mid-range deck that I have kind of latched onto as my build of choice for Pioneer, Historic, and Modern. This is a deck that takes the lessons we learned from Jund as to like what made Jund good. You know, disruption, good one for one removal. And just leans all the way into it. It feels like an amalgam of mono blue plus Jund. Because you combine stellar removal and disruption like you would have in Jund with little synergies and a pair of card advantage engines in the form of Croxa or Dreadhorde Arcanist that the, the more times you get to untap with them, the further behind your opponent gets until they die. This has actively, honestly, become my favorite deck to work on. Just, it, it like John, like is it dragons and standard right now? It feels like the kind of deck that just kind of takes everything on. You're not absolutely outclassed in any matchup if you've brought the right 75. And one of the big things is it demonstrates more than one thing to me. First and foremost, I am better at card evaluation than I thought. Because Dreadhorde Arcanist was one of the first cards I looked at from War of the Spark and said, oh my goodness, that thing's good. That's, that's basically what you use Snapcaster for, but every turn. That's really good. And then it didn't take off in standard and there was doubt. But I, I you know, stuck to my guns, I worked on it. Ended up being pretty good. Uh, the Feather, the Heroic deck was pretty good before all was said and done. The ability to play Domri's Ambush with Dreadhorde Arcanist was really sweet. And then the the penultimate build ended up being a red-black deck with Croxa and Village Rights and Claim the Firstborn. And all, all of those things were in standard together. And it ended up being an absolute blast to play. So, it also shows me, beyond shadow of a doubt, the power of a nimble and flexible framework, which is to say, the core of like what the deck does doesn't actually take up a lot of room. 
you know, if you want to, it depend depending on whether you want to be proactive or reactive, you've got more slots you got to fill. But the core of the deck is basically just Dreadhorde, Arcanist, Croxa, and a bunch of stuff. And if you want to be the more the the more reactive version with more removal and more cantrips and more card advantage, you end up leaning into cards like Young Pyromancer, Luris as Companion, and uh, Village Rights, Claim the Firstborns, just kind of trying to grind your opponent into the dust. But you can also take that same nimble framework, Arcanist Croxa Disruption, and a little bit of removal, decent amount of burn spells, and you can play a proactive red-black blitz version in Modern with Kiln Fiend, Monastery Swift Spear, Soul Scar Mage. And, you know, you thought sees your opponent's removal spell out before combat, they are forced to take action now. And then you attack and you thought sees again, and you keep ripping their hand apart. And every time you do, your Kiln Fiend gets bigger. And if you have the Teamer Battle Rage, they die. Uh, there's been variations on the on the theme from other players better than me that I've really been interested in as well. Uh, most notably, John Ramos' Sedgemore build for Historic that incorporates the Plum the Forbidden engine from Standard, which I think is really cool. There's also the prospect that I never considered, which is playing Arcanist alongside not Domri's Ambush, but a Tarkus Command as a way to get a powerful proactive draw out of your deck. Wherein you declare attacks with, you know, a prowess creature and an Arcanist, and then you cast a Tarkus Command pre-combat, everybody gets plus one, plus one, deal three damage, declare attacks, you're attacking for, for five, cast the Atarkus command again for plus one, plus one across the board and another three damage. So now you're attacking for... Now you're attacking for eight and you've shot them for six along the way. So just all the way around, it seems like a really cool place to be if at the end of the day, your goal is to win the game going long. There's a lot of different ways to build the deck. Splash colors, no splash colors, proactive, reactive. Do you find room for any sort of a combo package or some sort of an over-the-top package? All of that is up to you based on the tournament you're playing, based on whatever, right? And that's what I love about it. That's the big thing it's shown me is just how valuable it is to have an archetype that is flexible because it lowers the number of cards you have to pay a lot of attention to from the prospect of acquisition. So that's all I've got for this week, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we will save dad jokes for next week. So for now, if you've got questions, comments, concerns, leave them in the comment section below. If you're, if you're checking this out on YouTube, if you want to follow me, you can do so on Twitter at Homeward Path MTG. You can join the conversation in our Facebook group, the Homeward Pathfinders. If you want to become a patron to get access to our Patron Pathfinders Discord, you can do so at patreon.com slash Homeward Path MTG. Don't forget to check out the sponsors, Grey Viking Games and Pure MTGO. And with that, I will leave you for the week. So... Laugh hard, build good decks, be kind, be safe, and we'll catch y'all next week.